It's 11 o'clock central and so nine uh, Pacific time. We're ready to get started. All good. All right. Fantastic. And I know um, some more folks are going to continue to um, to jump in. Let's start with uh, let's start with prayer and then um, we'll have our presenters for this workshop introduce themselves. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Um, blessed, loving, creating God, we give you thanks for this morning. We give you thanks for all the ways that you um, inspire us to meet the challenges of our time and the challenges of our place. Um, the way you tickle and um, nudge and cajole us um, into, into creativity. We give you thanks for those who are um, gathered here for this um, convention of the Diocese of Spokane. Send us your Holy Spirit um, that we might make some mutual discovery um, and innovation even as we journey together this morning. In the name of Jesus, your child, we pray. Amen. Great. All right. If you're just jumping on, um, again, let me just extend the invitation to introduce yourself quickly in the in the chat box. We'll do a little bit more breakout um, and small group conversation as we move along. Um, so let me uh, let me introduce myself real fast, and then we're actually going to um, have our presenters go around and introduce themselves more deeply. Um, I'm Katie Nakamura Ringers, the presiding bishop staff officer for church planting. And I am joining you this morning from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so sending prayers your way from the Bible Belt. Um, very different part of the country than you all are in. So I'm so eager to hear about some more of your experiences. Um, this session is called uh, Tilling Our Soil, Planting New Seeds. And with me are um, some folks who are doing and have done exactly that kind of work. Um, Jonathan Myers, Arlen Farley, and Katie Shedlock. Can we go around real quick um, and introduce ourselves? Jonathan, you're on my right. Would you uh, jump in? Sure. Tell us like, you know, and why, why you're part of this workshop. Um, <clears throat> part of this workshop because uh, Bishop Gretchen said you're part of this workshop. Um, so um, as many of us know, um, this is what we do. Um, I, um, Jonathan Myers, I, I live in Spokane, Washington, and um, have uh, co-founded uh, Creator's Table um, with Pastor Katie Shedlock, um, and I work at the West Central Abbey. Um, many of you know the West Central Episcopal Mission. I'm also the vicar at St. Andrew's, Spokane. Um, and I've also been part of uh, starting new communities um, over in the Seattle area. Um, even started a brewery um, that was also potentially going to be a church um, in Asheville, North Carolina um, some years ago. So kind of been on the fringes of doing this work for, for a little while. So um, it's good to be here. Awesome. Arlen, you're next on my screen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am also part of this workshop because Bishop Gretchen asked me to be part of this workshop. So Jonathan and I have that in common. Um, I'm currently an associate priest at the Cathedral of St. John here in Spokane. Um, but in past lives, I have been a part of five different church plants. Um, one that I co-founded in San Francisco called Eucharist SF. Um, all of them except one church plant was not a part of the Episcopal tradition but the church that I co-founded um, in San Francisco, we called ourselves sacramental at the table, evangelical in the pulpit, charismatic in the pew, and Anabaptist in the streets. So have been a part of um, church planning work for, for 10 years, spent five years preparing for it, and I'm really excited to be with you today. Yay, great, Arlen and Katie Shedlock. Good morning. My name is Katie Shedlock. I'm a United Methodist pastor and I've been appointed as a church planter for the last uh, just over three years. Um, 
I came into the Episcopal sphere uh, through working with Jonathan Myers um, and the uh, the ability to have our newly gathering community meet um, on a historic Episcopal property uh, in Spokane at um, what was Holy Trinity Episcopal Church. That's the physical home of our community. Uh, and so I'm excited to be with you this morning. Thanks. Yay. Exciting. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask. Mallory, is there anything you need to tell us about using Zoom or anything we're supposed to be doing? Yeah, um, I think we're already pretty much doing it. Um, so basically just, I think, um, if you guys could stay muted um, until you have to speak or, or any of those um, things that we need to do, um, just go ahead and do that. It looks like you guys are already doing that because um, it will take away the video from our presenters. So we wanna make sure that you all can see them and um, see what they're trying to present. So um, just make sure that you stay muted. If you have any questions of a technical nature, you can probably message, just message me in the chat box and I can um, try to problem solve for you. Beautiful, thanks so much. All right, um, so welcome. We're gonna get started and you have all hopefully introduced yourself just a little um, in the chat box. And I know Zoom is kind of this hard platform, um, but I'm gonna ask uh, just a few questions and if you could give me kind of a, like a hand raise, if, if this applies to you, do that. And I'm, it's gonna take me a second to kind of scroll through all the little images. But I'm curious um, if you just like raise your hand real fast, if you are a lay leader or lay delegate to convention. Fantastic, yay. And how about clergy, deacons, priests, bishops, all that kind of thing, great. Um, who here, I'm so curious about this, um, is, is part of a church plant right now? Who would consider themselves to be part of a church that has been somewhat recently planted? I'm scrolling through. Does anybody have their hand up? In some ways, it, it might be better even if you don't. Oh, we go, well, we got Katie. Okay, that's great. Um, does anyone here have any memory of your church being planted? Like, you know, were you there, were you around 25 or 30 years ago when your church was planted? Anybody? You might have to unmute if I'm not seeing your hand. Oh, we got Frederick. Frederick Jessup, all right, great. That's so interesting. Um, so I said in, I don't know if you uh, were able to see my invitational video um, for this workshop, Tilling Our Soil, Planting New Seeds. Um, but you probably saw that this was gonna be led by a group of church planters. My church planting was in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the Abbey got started about six or seven-ish years ago, if you count kind of the, the year that we had the idea before we really launched. Um, and one of the things we really want to emphasize uh, in this workshop is that um, this isn't really gonna be about church planting. This is gonna be about um, the fact that what church plants have to offer um, to the rest of the church um, is that uh, in some ways uh, church plants, because they're just getting started, um, are just now discovering and in some cases rediscovering um, some of the practices and behaviors that are applicable to any church um, of any size of any age. And so that's what our team, we, we've had two or three um, really strong, just kind of brainstorming moments where we said, um, what is it that we've seen people do in these new communities um, that actually could be done anywhere? Um, and I wanna, I wanna just kind of, as an introduction, show you um, a slide that we came up with, with four themes on here. So you'll have a, a sense of the direction that we're that we're going in. Let me share screen. And put it in present view. 
Um, so as we were talking about our experience with new communities, there were four themes that just kept coming up over and over again. Um, one of the first was the, um, the practice of recognizing the Holy Spirit at work in places other than the church building. Honestly, I think in this time of COVID, that's one that we um, are all developing our skill at um, as we've been forced out of those church buildings and um, doing church in some different spaces in different ways. The second is practicing relational evangelism. Third, practicing participatory worship. And then the fourth, this is my favorite, um, learning from scrappiness. Um, I am curious, just before we turn this over to uh, Katie Shedlock, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing real fast so we can see each other a little better. I'm curious, any of you um, who have been part of a church plant or observed a church plant, even if it was like 30 years ago, right? Um, are any of those kind of themes ringing true for you or a part of your experience? Or, or if your church is not um, part of a church plant, does any of that stand out? You can, answer, you can answer that in the chat box if you'd like or unmute yourself. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Well, if some of those thoughts um, that's within the memory of your experience of church um, start to come out, we're inviting you to um, continue, continue thinking about that, continue thinking about um, what your experience of the, some of these themes has, has been. Good. And then as well as, as our um, folks are introducing their theme um, and showing pictures, we invite you to continue using the chat box for some questions um, and comments. And we'll save all of that um, as a document later on um, and send it your way. All right, um, Katie Shedlock, I wanna turn it over to you um, and ask you to, to talk a little bit about this idea of really seeing the church and the Holy Spirit at work outside the walls of the church, how you've learned that, um, what your community's experience of that kind of work has been, and then if there's some questions that you've got for us that we can really use to get our imaginations turned on. Awesome, thanks Katie. Uh, so I'll start by, um, talking about the the order that I was given, order might be a, a strong word, the invitation that I was given uh, when I started as a church planter, which was in uh, 2017. Uh, someone from the church planting office to which I'm responsible in my United Methodist infrastructure um, really encouraged us to go out into the community and learn about how people are gathering together outside of church. Right, you've probably heard the statistics that the Pacific Northwest is one of the most unchurched, dechurched, non-churched parts of the country. Uh, but certainly people still get together in community, in public spaces. Uh, so to go see how that is happening and, uh, and what, what we could learn from it as church planters. So I was uh, scrolling through social media a couple weeks after I had started my new position. And I was looking at uh, stuff in, in arts organizations in Spokane, um, just because I have a background in theater and it was, it was things that I was naturally gravitating towards anyway, places that I would naturally wanna go, wanna show up. Uh, and I ended up on the Spokane Poetry Slam Facebook page. And the first comment at the very top of the page was someone had written, this is my church. And I was like, well, I guess I have to go. <laughs> Sometimes God is just so blazingly obvious, we cannot ignore it, right? And so that was, that was one of those moments for me. And so I looked to see when the next Poetry Slam was gonna be occurring. Um, and there was one uh, within a week or so. And so I decided to go and, uh, and to check it out. Uh, a Poetry Slam, uh, for those of you who might not know, is uh, like the competitive rock and roll version of a poetry reading. Uh, so if you imagine a poetry reading, uh, you know, people stand up, they read lovely poems, that people are wearing, I don't know, tweed jackets and drinking tea. There's like little golf claps, right? A poetry slam is the opposite of that in that it is loud, it is raucous, 
the, the poetry is not so much read as it is performed in a, in a fully embodied sense. Uh, the, 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 the response to the poems is really full-throated. Uh, I would always be hoarse the morning after a poetry slam, <laughs> not from reading my own poetry, but from screaming and cheering for, uh, for everybody else's poetry. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a really uh, lovely, lovely community for me to get to be a part of. Um, so the, the, a few things that I discovered when I started going to Poetry Slams uh, here in Spokane. And at that time, uh, the scene was really pretty vibrant. And so I had the opportunity to go to Poetry Slams uh, and open mics uh, a couple of times a month, which was great because I was meeting the same people uh, at Nido Burrito and at the Bartlett and at Boots Bakery. I was really uh, able to get to know the community in a, in a, in a full way relatively quickly. Um, and some of the things that that popped out at me right away as I started attending these poetry slams were number one, it was the best preaching that I had ever heard. It was raw, it was real, it was full of truth. A three minute poem when it's done well can leave you breathless and fill the room with air at the same time. Uh, and, and that to me was a total experience of the Holy Spirit. Um, so the best preaching that I had ever heard. And I, and I thought to myself, as I started attending these events, why don't I hear this kind of truth telling in the church? I long to hear this kind of truth telling in the church. And I, and I haven't heard it um, in as powerful as a way as, I've, as I'm hearing it at these poetry slams. Um, the second thing that I learned was that they give you the mic for three minutes if you're gutsy enough to sign up and anybody can sign up, anybody. You show up on time, you can sign up to read. And they'll give you the mic for three whole minutes. And if you talk about God in ways that are not terribly corny and cliche, not only will people listen to you, they'll even come up to you afterwards and say, hey, thank you for that poem. That was really meaningful. Uh, so it became for me a preaching opportunity. Uh, it's not just for me to listen to incredible preaching from other poets, but to have an opportunity, have a platform, have three minutes and a microphone with which to talk about God to a gathered community outside the church. Um, and I found for myself as I, because when I started, I had no experience with slam poetry. I was coming to it totally green off the street. Um, and so I had to, as a preacher, as a poet, uh, figure out, okay, how do I talk about God in a way that is authentic, in a way that is powerful, in a way that opens people's hearts and minds. Um, and so that was really good for, I think, even just my own theological development as, as a preacher. Um, and that has continued to influence my quote unquote traditional preaching uh, inside the church. Um, and then the third thing that really, uh, really stuck out to me is that poetry slams are church in the sense that it is a public gathered community, right? Anybody can walk in off the street, just like anybody can walk in off the street for a Sunday church service. And that community is gathered around certain values. And those values are, I think, deeply aligned with the values of Jesus Christ. We just don't necessarily have the same language for, for those values. Um, so, what I really wanted to do is, you know, pick you all up and take you to a poetry slam. <laughs> of course, in the time of COVID, uh, we even have to do poetry slams on Zoom, which is the most unsatisfying thing in the entire world. Uh, it's, yeah, it's no good. Uh, but what I did find um, is that Spokane Arts uh, made a little like mini documentary about the poetry scene in Spokane a couple of years ago. Um, and so I thought that I would share with you this video. It's, I think it's six or seven minutes long. And that'll really give you a sense of the flavor of uh, the spoken word community. Um, and in particular, what I, what I really want you to listen to as, uh, as you are watching this video is I would invite you to put on 
your anthropologist hat, <laughs> right? Think of it as you're gonna you're gonna study this the culture of this other gathered community that is the spoken word poetry community in Spokane, and every time that they say the words poetry scene or slam or the spoken word community in your head, I would invite you to substitute the word church, right? And see what that what that sparks for you or what that opens up for you. And so you're going to hear people, um, the, the, the folks who did, the, uh, who did this documentary, they interviewed a number of folks who were really heavily involved in the scene at that time. Um, and you'll hear them talk about what leadership looks like in the poetry community. You'll hear them talk about discipleship, right, in the sense of like, how do people get more involved? How do they become better and better practitioners of this, of this art form? You'll hear them talk about belonging, how people know that they are accepted and included uh, in this particular community. And I think these are all values that we have in the church. We just tend to use church language like discipleship. No one talks about discipleship outside the church, right? But every gathered community, if it's effective, has pathways for people to get more and more involved and to continue learning whatever it is that that, that community is gathered around at a deeper and deeper level. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to watch this video together uh, about Spokane Poetry Slam and then we'll have some some conversation. All right, uh, so I'm gonna invite us into some reflection and conversation. We'll have the opportunity to do a little bit more of that um, with, with some smaller groups. Um, but just uh, what did you hear about uh, belonging and how people enter into the poetry scene? Feel free to take yourself on mute and uh, off mute or put something in the chat either way. Uh, I this is Dolores. I heard the spoken word, involved, introspective, confessional, universe, inclusivity, safe space, um, less infighting, open attitude, lack of ego and posture, and racial diversity, and change your life. Awesome. Yeah. So that, that, that was a lot. Um, and, and some of those are reflected. Mallory just put in the chat. Um, she heard safe space, inclusivity, lack of posturing, lack of ego, right? I love that line about uh, if you have an ego, you're not going to survive in this scene. Um, I, would, I would love it if that was true of all of our churches too, right? If you have an ego, you're not going to survive in the church <laughs> or, or you're going to be reformed and conformed so that, uh, so that your participation uh, is, is healthy for, for everyone. Um, Vulnerability, yeah, definitely. That's something else that just came up in the chat, right? That folks come through the door and, uh, and they're greeted with vulnerability in the sense that other people, other leaders in the scene are modeling really personal, confessional, deeply moving, authentic poetry. David Gortner's got hand raised. Yeah. yeah it took, it took um, an amazing um, kind of modeling um, by the host and by those that were co-hosts um, to kind of create the, the, the spirit culture, if you will, of the place. And, uh, and I liked how there was also this set of um, practices and patterns that people just kind of learn by being in the community that set barriers for people seizing control um, and yet at the same time encourage them to step up. Yeah, so really collaborative and invitational leadership is something that I really saw modeled in the in the poetry scene and and the barriers to participation being really low right like when Fitz says it's almost better if you don't know anything when you walk in the door right is that true of our churches could it be true of our churches how how might we make that a possibility for our communities of faith uh, I see that Jan has in the chat different kinds of events yeah that's a another big thing about uh about the poetry scene is that people had multiple avenues to connect in any given month 
uh, at the time that this video was made and when I got involved, there were two slams, there was a weekly open mic, there was a different monthly open mic in these different venues, and yet it was one community that had many different doorways that a person could walk through. So someone might start by going to Boot Slam, they might start by accidentally being at Nido Burrito for dinner when a poetry slam interrupt, you know, interrupted their dinner. They might start by being at Auntie's bookstore and it coming over the loudspeaker, you know, uh, we're gonna be starting soon. If you'd like to hear some things, come sit down so that the, the community was accessible in, in that way. Encouragement to learn, yeah, is something else in the chat, right? That uh, I think um, the leadership, particularly Isaac Grambo, who was in the film, um, when I started, he did a great job of, of saying, we have a culture of, of being really kind and really excited to see new people, right? So when we would take a break, we would do you know the first set, maybe 10 poets get up, do their work, and then we would take a break. He would say, these are some of the things that I want you to do at the break. I want you to go find somebody and say, great job, I loved your poem, right? Yeah, you can take a bathroom break. Yeah, you can go out and have a cigarette. Yeah, you can go get a drink at the bar, but go find someone and say, nice job, right? Um, and that explicit invitation, uh, I just think, like what if when we pass the piece, <laughs> right? There was something like that, that was where we were intentionally seeking one another out to say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Nice work, come back next time, right? We've got a couple of hands up, maybe uh, Katie McDonald and then Kimmy. So basically for me, when I heard um, Safe Space, my mind immediately went to Camp Cross, which is um, basically a really open, safe space for youth and different groups, like adult ministry groups. And um, basically, we're a safe space, and um, it's all of the things that were mentioned in that video, um, vulnerability, uh, safe space, stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I found really powerful as I started getting involved was how that safe space was communicated and embodied. Um, and the first way that it was communicated and embodied was just that people were openly and authentically themselves, unapologetically, right? Like, um, and they talk in the video about how uh, having in particular Fitz, who's non-binary and trans, like elevated to leadership, to, to being the host, made that a safer space for other people who might identify that way, right? They could see someone who they resonated with being in leadership. Um, and I think the other thing that, uh, that uh, Isaac really did really well, and this wasn't in the video, but but he also often said, at, you know, it's part of my job as host to make sure that if you have a problem of some kind, right, if you're here at the Poetry Slam and somebody's bothering you or, you know, you're not, there's something that's inhibiting your ability to feel comfortable and be glad that you're here, come talk to me, right? He just, he made that, he designated himself as a safe person in leadership publicly so that people would know who to go to if if there was some kind of issue which i think really also helped create that that safe space for the community one of the things that i it, this is reflected in some of what folks have already said but um i really wanted to emphasize the the in, dramatic and incredible inclusivity so sometimes we talk about inclusivity and we'll mean like we'll kind of focus it on one way to do inclusivity, but we're talking about age. People who were interviewed were like, one one guy looked like he was barely 20, and then there were also some folks who looked like they might be in their 60s. So this wide range of ages, and of course, gender orientation, um, but, but maybe most importantly was um, experience and or skill level. So, it doesn't matter if you're really experienced as a poet or you're brand new to this, that, that folks are invited and welcome wherever they are to, to participate and to be a part of what's happening. So that inclusivity is a, was, was really, really struck me and really stuck out. And I think about in churches, how can I as a leader, but also how can we as a whole community um, practice Inclusive, radical inclusivity and what 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 does that look like not just in the ways we normally think of with gender or age but all varieties of or race right all varieties of ways to be inclusive 
Yeah, definitely. I think one of my favorite illustrations of that point is one night at, at, a, at Boots, we were having a slam and this uh, older lady who um, I think she was probably in her 80s and she had definitely come in her mind to a poetry reading. <laughs> and so uh, she was a little shocked at the environment that, that she ended up in, uh, but she signed up to read, right? And she went up and she read her adorable older lady poems about her garden and everybody screamed and cheered for her just as enthusiastically as if she had done something more quote unquote normal for that community. And so I think that's, yeah, that's a great example of how that inclusivity and that welcome uh, can really be enacted because I think that's um, everything about poetry slams is deeply embodied, right? And so I think that's another huge lesson for us in the church is when we hold these values, how do we live them? How do we get them into our, into our bodies? And so that screaming, that cheering, that clapping, that was one way for, for that community to embody that value. Awesome. Any, uh, any last thoughts that you want to raise before we do a little bit of breakout conversation? I see, uh, going back to this idea of safe space, um, that uh, Mallory brings up the, the uh, idea of ownership, right? Like if you have an ownership stake in your community, then that, that helps maintain the community as a safe space. And I think um, poetry, the, the spoken word scene is very democratic, right? Whoever walks in the door, whoever signs up. And, and there definitely were instances in my involvement where something negative would happen, right? But again, because the leaders had said, we are creating a particular culture, we're clear on what that culture is. If you see something that, that violates those norms, let us know and we, and we wanna address it. And so um, I think that, uh, that empowerment of folks really uh, helped to keep the community a, a safer space. Well, I wanna um, take just a, a few minutes and um, I'm thinking, looking at the time, uh, that maybe rather, um, actually, I think, yeah, I think if we do uh, uh, just a few minutes of breakout, uh, this is the question that I want to pose to you for, for maybe about three or four minutes uh, in, in conversation with others. For me, the community that I walked into, that I learned from, happened to be the spoken word poetry community. That's just me. That's just my story, my journey what are the communities, what are the churches outside of church, maybe that you already participate in, or maybe that you've always wanted to participate in? What are the equivalents in terms of what, who you could learn from and, and how you might bring those values into, into your church, right? So, so I have really, really benefited as a pastor and a church planter from having one foot in this poetry scene and one foot inside the church and, and thinking about how these two things work together. For you, it might not be poetry. For you, it might be any number of other communities that you gather with that you learn from, that you enjoy, that are places where you can authentically show up as yourself and be in relationship and learn from other people. What are those spaces, even if they're on pause right now because of COVID, where you might have a poetry experience or where you might be bringing in those values to, to your congregation? Um, so I'm gonna invite us to take maybe three or four minutes in breakouts to talk about that with each other and then we'll uh, come back to the large group. Perfect, and as Mallory sends you an invitation to join a breakout group, just note you'll have to click accept the invitation to go to your room, and then she will automatically bring us all back together. Well, if we're all back, then I'll say thanks so much for uh, listening to my portion. I, I hope that this sparked some, uh, some questions for you, some ideas for you. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jonathan. Um, thank you so much, Katie. That was, uh, that was invigorating. Um, and uh, it, it brought up some good memories of some poetry slams that I've been to and some other events that I've been to. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna be talking um, a little bit about uh, the relational evangelism piece um, that, uh, that was brought up earlier. 
Um, so I'm actually going to do a bit of a slideshow. This will be a little bit less interactive than, than Katie's um, session. So a little bit of variety. Um, and just going to share some uh, ideas and some concepts. And uh, there will be um, some space to uh, talk in the chat. So if, if something comes up for you, um, you know, please, please write it in the chat. And then specifically, I'll have some specific questions later on to talk about in the chat. So um, I'm going to start my, start my timer here so I don't veer off too much. So, um, so we're talking about building relationships, um, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about the word evangelism, but um, ideally what we're talking about is, um, is relationship building. And I recently just came across this quote from Meister Eckhart, and I'll just invite us to sit with that for a second. Um, and suddenly you just know, it's time to start something new and trust the magic of beginnings. So just notice what that, what that sparks within you, what sensations you, you feel um, or you notice. Um, is it something that resonates with you? Does it excite you? Does it scare you? Um, and church planters have the uh, the gift and, and the daunting challenge of beginning with a with a new field um, or um, retilling an old field. Um, so, for for a lot of us, the the question is: if the church is people, which I believe it is, then how do you get the people um, to begin being a church, right? So there's a formation piece to that. So how do you, how do you sort of connect with folks, with people? Um, there's lots of different methods to, to do this, um, but to oversimplify, I think there's generally two approaches. There's an attractional approach and then there's a relational approach. Um, and so an attractional model um, uh, typically begins with a group of people. They might be borrowed from another church who, who want to start a new church. Um, the attraction model typically has a big budget, has some bells and whistles to it. Um, you might have a musician, a paid musician. You might have, you might have a building. Um, you, know, you might have some of the accoutrements that we're used to in our churches. Um, this is typically more associated with our evangelical siblings. Um, who have kind of popularized this method that they borrowed from the business world. Um, but there are Episcopal church plants who have appropriated this, this model and, and have done that well. Um, so the idea is that you create a church or you form a church and you advertise it to new people that you're open and you show that you're an attractive new option. Um, this is the uh, uh, just build it and they will, and they will come approach, right? Um, and, and I put this slide up as, as a way of understanding that this is a spectrum. Um, I don't want these to be kind of binaries that are pitted against each other. Um, so I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this model. Um, and I would say that our communities of faith and, um, and our liturgies, our physical spaces, um, that I think they should be attractive. Um, or, or maybe a better way to say that is I think they should be beautiful. Um, and, and people are always attracted to that which they find beautiful. Um, and so um, I, I think of something that the Apostle Paul um, said. Um, see, I can't. There we go. Um, to, um, to keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. Um, fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, uh, praising God always in Philippians 4, 8. So, um, so being attractive is, is, is something good. Um, and being, um, in fact, in this diocese, we're called to be a creative and compelling witness. Um, maybe um, you can give an amen to that with your reaction button. Um, but things that are creative and compelling are always attractive, okay? But that's very different than being attractional. Um, and so I think that this attractional option is limited and I think it's potentially dangerous if it's our only approach. So um, for those of us who are in um, established or settled congregations, 
um, congregations that have been around for multiple decades. Um, I think it's, it's easier for us to fall into this model um, because we have a lot of stuff already kind of set in place. Um, we have systems, we, we have people, um, those kinds of things. And so um, you might hear yourself saying these kinds of things if you're kind of veering into staying only in the attractional model. You might hear yourself say the question, you know, how can we get more people to come to worship? Um, or if you hear the phrase that begins with if, if only, right? If, if only we had a choir, if only we have a better choir, if we had better music, if we had new vestments, if we had more children or youth or a, a better program and so on and so forth. Um, I think this is falling prey to the worst side of that attractional model. So, um, so the question really for a lot of church planters um, in, in, in this space that we get to ask these kinds of questions is, um, what if we're not starting with a building? Um, what if we're not starting with a community of people or a large budget, which many of us are not, and we'll talk more about that in the scrappiness part of it. Um, or what if our gifting doesn't follow this attractional business model? Some of us are just not gifted that way. Um, and um, a question like for me is, what if as a matter of principle, we simply do not believe this is the healthiest model? You know, what do we, what do we do? Um, and so that's kind of what we'll talk about when we get into the relational piece of this. But I do want to um, do a quick sidebar on evangelism. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's an ugly word um, right now. It hasn't always been that way, um, but it's been co-opted and misappropriated by many Christians and reduced to mean something along the lines of um, attempting to get someone to say that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior for the purpose of securing their rights to eternal life in heaven, right? It's almost like the fine print at the end of the, of the commercial um, for the drug that tells you that, you know, these are all the side effects. Um, you read through it real fast, but the idea is that you just kind of secure that transaction. Um, I, I think about it, it's very similar to like free agency in sports or, um, you know, kind of trying to convince somebody to buy one car versus another or trade in their car. Um, and so this is on that previous slide where the word transactional was underneath that spectrum of relational and attractional. Um, relationships can be transactional, um, certainly. Um, and those are tend to be unhealthy relationships. Um, but in this attractional church model um, or posture or way of being, um, the transaction is really, really um, prominent or can be really prominent. So um, the other way that it's reduced down and Episcopalians are guilty of this, um, probably more so than the other, um, and that is evangelism is about in, inviting people to church. Um, now, I would argue that this is a, a less slimy version than, than the other version um, that we talked about, but um, getting someone to come to your church it may not be a bad thing, but it may not be the best thing for that person. It may not be the right thing for that person in that moment. It may not even be the best thing or healthiest thing for your church in that moment. Um, and so um, the other thing to say about these, these two versions of, of evangelism is they aren't even actually about evangelism. Um, so evangelism literally means sharing good news. Um, so if we can agree that God is bigger than the church building, um, at least, um, and if we can agree that with the Lord's prayer, where it says on earth as it is in heaven, then, um, the good news really, um, falls outside of this spectrum, um, and, um, of, of reducing evangelism to conversion and invitation to church. So, um, and I, I find the word sharing really, really powerful in this. Um, and so I think of um, sharing food with, with another person. Um, I think of how um, kids, um, when they're the best selves, they share their toys. I think about sh students sharing notes with each other, you know, helping their classmates um, do better in school. So um, it's, it's, it's about good news. Um, and it's about sharing. 
Um, so that would be something that I would invite, um, invite you to, to write in the chat, um, to ask this question of yourself, especially now when all around us seems uh, terrible and dark, right? Or challenging or tense. Um, what is good news? Um, or just take off the word news. What is good? Um, and think about these words from the Apostle Paul. You know, what is beautiful? What is loving? Um, what is trustworthy and reliable? Um, and these are the things that we want to share with others. Um, and, and as we begin to think about what does the word relational mean or what does relationship building mean? Um, sharing is, is an antidote to um, a transactional culture, right? So just write in the chat, what is good um, right now? What is beautiful? Um, what is loving? Um, any of those things. Um, and that's good news, right? And, the, and that good news is always rooted um, in, the, in the spirit, is always rooted in, in the triune God. So um, I'd also love to know like what, um, what comes to mind for you when you hear the word relational. Um, and I'm actually gonna, um, can you still see the screen? Is it still sharing the screen at least? Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna write these things in. So um, what comes to mind for you when you hear the word relational? Just unmute yourself and one, one, two words. What does relational mean? Connected. Connected. Two ways. Sharing experience. To hear two ways. Mallory, what did you offer up? I said people. People. What else? Somebody else said this, but I um, was going to also say it, that um, there are, it's more than one, more than one person involved. Community. Openness. Friendship. Great. Friendship. Healthy and unhealthy. Healthy and unhealthy. Yeah. Caring comes to mind for me. Caring. Wonderful. Understand. Understanding. Understanding. Beautiful. Volunteer. What was that last one? Well, I'm going to offer up a, a few words um, as well. Um, reciprocity, right? Mutuality. Um, I think that that was mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I think transformation. When I think of the relationships in my life that have meant the most to me, um, they've changed me and I've changed them. Um, and as uh, was mentioned earlier, um, sometimes I've been in, in powerful relationships that have changed me in unhealthy ways, right? Um, that's the power of, of relationship. Um, connection was, was mentioned. Um, there's, there's depth to relationship. Um, when, when just thinking about relationships in general, right? Um, there's, there's often at the beginning, there's a level of attraction, right? Somebody's attractive. I'm attracted to a lot of different people, right? I think a lot of different people are beautiful. Um, but I don't have a depth of, of relationship with all those beautiful people that I know, right? Um, and some of them I don't even know. Um, so, um, so there's a depth to it. And, um, and, and relationships are slow. Relationships take time. 
And um, sometimes when we get in, locked into this scarcity idea of church, we get worried, I think, about um, are we going to grow um, quick enough? Um, and, um, and this work about re being relational, especially for church planters, is really challenging because sometimes we're on deadlines um, to, um, to grow a church to a certain size or get to a, a certain uh, benchmark. Um, but the relational work is, is much, much slower. Um, so thank you all for um, contributing to that. Um, I, I just uh, wrote this down um, and then I was like, oh, I'll just keep it. Um, but relational evangelism is, is the compost for the attractional church. So you can do whatever you want with that. But um, when, we, when we think about relationships, um, you know, I think we need to, to think on like two different levels. One is the individual and one's the, one is the communal. Um, so Jesus says very clearly that the law and the prophets hang on the simple concept that um, we're to love God and love neighbor as self. Um, so when I allow that to read me, what I hear is that um, God is rooted in relationship and it's going to be a struggle to love a neighbor um, as myself if I don't love myself in the way that God loves me. So um, it always begins with a heart to heart with yourself and knowing where you find goodness in God. Um, and then we're able to have heart to heart with, with others. Um, this isn't to say that we have to figure ourselves out first totally in order to be in relationships or to do this kind of relational sharing of good news. Um, so, you know, whether you're 21 or 41 or 61 or 81, we're all still learning how to love ourselves. Um, so we can't let that keep us from loving others, but it does remind us um, that we often cannot love others beyond our capacity to love ourselves. And the same is true for our churches, right? So we live in a hyper individualistic society, but we have to think communally about this as well because we're all part of communities of faith. And so there's an individual self and there's an individual other to be in relationship with. Um, there's a communal self and a communal other to be in relationship with. So um, a lot of abstract thinking, very conceptual, right? Um, but um, there are practices in terms of how to be um, in relationship. And um, there are going to just be two that I'm going to highlight and talk about. And um, the first one is relational or one-to-one -one meetings. And um, as a part of this workshop at the end, you're going to get a, a PDF that's going to uh, give you a great outline. It's on the Episcopal Church Evangelism Initiatives website. It comes out of the Industrial Areas Foundation work, uh, which is community organizing. Um, about how to have relational or one-to-one -one meetings. Um, you can interchange those words, whichever one you like um, more. Um, but a relational meeting is, is the basic building block um, to kind of being in community or community organizing. Um, to use biblical language, you could call it the cornerstone. Um, so relational meetings, what they help us do is they help us form relationships. They help us welcome people from all ends of a spectrum. Um, they help us discern where the spirit is moving. Um, they help us identify our own gifts and others' gifts and wisdom, um, discover common purpose and to build power. Um, they stir up ideas. Um, it helps us get feedback for our, our ministries. Um, and they, they build a culture of relationship and trust. Um, Having a one-to-one -one meeting um, in the way that will be outlined um, in, 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 the, in the document and in the work um, is uh, it's a way of getting to the heart level with another person to get to the gut level, which is where our dreams and our big ideas, our hopes, our fears live. So those are the things we want to connect around, right? Um, and, and ultimately, that's a very attractive um, thing for folks. Um, so in church planting, um, I've started with questions like, you know, hey, I'm new to the neighborhood. Um, what do you love most about the neighborhood? Right. Um, I've asked questions like, um, what keeps you up at night? Or what gets you up in the morning? Right. So you, you see that it's not surface level, right? You can, you can actually kind of go deep 
um, with another person um, fairly quickly, even if you don't know them that well. Um, but it's a way of getting to know another person. Um, and so um, right now um, at Creator's Table, um, one of the questions that we're asking is um, just beginning with, hey, I, I would really like to, for us to be an anti-racist church. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Or what does that mean to you? Um, I don't have a prescribed idea about what being an anti-racist church is. Um, I actually want to know, like, let's build it together, right? Um, and so this is, this, is the, this is the kind of the way into these one-to-one -one meetings. So it's not a casual coffee conversation. Um, and it's not an interview, right? Those are, those are transactional um, models. Um, this really is reciprocal. It's about sharing and receiving, okay? So you share your story and you allow someone else to share their story. Um, so the question, what does building relationships across difference and around common hopes and dreams and desires sound like in the kind of divided world that we live in today? To me, that sounds like good news. Right? The second relational practice is um, of building partnerships. This is that communal piece of the self, right? So um, you're a part of uh, a St. Stephen's or, um, you know, a, a St. Mark's or a St. Luke's, right? Um, um, that's a communal self. There's an identity around that. And there are other groups um, that have those kinds of community values, right? We heard about the spoken word community in, in Spokane and other places, right? Um, so there's communal senses of, of relationships. So um, we do the work of relationship building in the context of groups um, and organizations that might be working towards some things in common. Um, I love this quote, um, and I use it often from Letty Russell, we can identify the basic qualities of partnership. They would seem to include commitment that involves responsibility, vulnerability, equality, and trust among persons or groups who share a variety of gifts or resources, common struggle and work involving risk, continued growth, and hopefulness in moving toward a goal or a purpose, transcending the group itself, and contextuality in interacting with a wider community of persons social structures, values, beliefs that may provide support, correctives, or feedback. There is never a complete equality in a dynamic relationship, but a pattern of equal regard and mutual acceptance among partners is essential. And when such a relationship is alive and growing, we usually find the gifts of synergy, serendipity, and sharing. Um, and that is to say that partners produce an overspill of energy that is greater than the sum of the parts and that displays unexpected or serendipitous gifts and impulses to share that energy with others. So essentially what we're looking at doing and developing partnerships in our communities with other groups and organizations who um, are working in a common struggle, right? Um, for, uh, for goodness, for the common good is we're taking the idea of a relational meeting and we're forging partnerships through that, um, through that practice. Um, so, you know, you could think about who are the groups in your neighborhood or your town or your city and who might you be able to work together with on, on a project or on working towards something together. Um, and again, the question for me is right now in the world that we live in, what does working together toward a shared vision look like in a world that cannot distinguish between fact and fake? To me, again, that sounds like good news. Um, I would imagine people would, would see that and think um, there's something really, um, really great going on there. Um, and then lastly, I would just say, um, to allow others to do evangelism for you. Um, and this might seem counterintuitive, but it's actually kind of amazing, especially for those of us who are introverts and, introverts and shy. Um, 
and um, the um, kind of the best way that, that I can talk about it is um, we all exist in triangles, right? Um, and we talk about triangulation a lot in the church, and that's a bad thing, um, and it is, but um, we all live in triangles. And um, I was talking about this idea of we should maybe have a farmer's market in our neighborhood. And I was talking about it with somebody and, and they were like, oh, it sounds like a great idea. I'm really into food, um, into the community. Um, that person went and told somebody else about the idea. Um, a week down the road, two weeks down the road, that other person, person C, whoever that was, um, came up to me and said, hey, I heard you're talking about doing this farmer's market. I've actually been really involved um, in farmer's markets in the past. I would love to help out, love to make that happen in the neighborhood. I care about the neighborhood. I care about good food, right? Now, imagine that that person C has already also talked about it with uh, maybe three other people, right? So now all of a sudden there's other energy that's helping the, um, the sharing of the good news, right? It's actually being shared among, among the community. Um, and so, um, you know, there'll be an opportunity for you to, to think about having some, um, practice at this kind of stuff later on, um, down the road, we'll send out a homework assignment. Um, and the, and the first will be, um, to, to have a relational one-to-one -one meeting. And again, we'll have the, the handout for you so you can kind of see, you know, what kinds of questions you can ask, how you would invite somebody to that, those kinds of things. Um, and um, so have a one-to-one -one, uh, meeting with somebody in your church. You know, you can start there in, in, a, in a safe environment. Um, talk, about some, talk about some of these things with a, with a vestry member, a bishop's committee member. Um, if you're on a vestry or bishop's committee, maybe make that um, a goal um, to do that at the beginning of the year. Um, and then also I would invite everybody, you can do it today or tomorrow, but sit down and write down all the groups and organizations um, that are doing things that you would like to learn more about, right? Um, in, your, in your neighborhood, in your town, in your city, um, whatever makes sense, what are the groups doing good, good work that you wanna know more about? Um, and then invite them into that, so. Um, so that was a lot, you know, just kind of going at you. Um, we've got about 10 or, or 20 minutes, I believe. Um, somebody correct me if the time is off. Um, but um, this is just kind of a time for open um, questions and conversations. Um, anybody from our, from our team can, can jump in and respond. Um, maybe Arlen, you can kind of begin if, if you were able to track what people wrote in the chat in terms of what is good, um, what's good news for people. Um, and then just, yeah, ask us any questions um, from what you've heard so far, um, where things are resonating, what things are disconnecting. I think one of the most um, maybe provocative questions that came up in the chat was a uh, question from Tony Green about the relationship between proclamation and sharing. Um, and if, if I put that in conversation with David Gortner's comment about authenticity in Christ, it raises a question for me about what's the relationship between sharing um, what is good news to me and sharing Jesus. Um, who is the Jesus that I'm sharing? Um, I think implied in evangelism is um, sharing Jesus. And maybe that's part of one of the complicated triangles that we're in <laughs> and trying to name. And um, yeah. I wonder um, what that intersection brings up for people and I wonder for you, Jonathan, you know, as a strategic decision in talking about evangelism, um, you've talked primarily about relationship instead of primarily about Jesus, which is a provocative way to say it. But um, I'd love to hear folks reflect on, on their sense of why that might be. Not just you reflect on it, but, but I'd love to hear um, some conversation about that. 
Yeah. I, I mean, for me, they're, um, they're indistinguishable from each other. Right. And so, um, following the way of Jesus, I mean, that's, that's re the relationship I'm rooted in. Right. And so the idea of sharing comes from him. Um, the, the challenge is because evangelism, um, and because conversion has become such a sticky idea or concept in our culture, we have to decouple um, those things from each other. Um, and um, it's the reason why people show up to a, why young people will show up to a poetry slam, um, but not to a church, right? So. I think, um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, David. So one of the errors that um, Episcopalians, Catholics, mainline Christians can make with regard to evangelism is, yes, it needs to be decoupled from conversion or getting butts in the pews, right? Um, but that very, I think people make too quick a jump to, um, therefore, I will not say anything as if the saying becomes an act of intrusion rather than an act of authentic sharing of your own identity. Um, and at the same time, I mean, the way I think about evangelism is I'm, I'm listening for signs of God's grace and goodness in, in people's lives, including my own, and then speaking of it, um, and then letting it go, you know? So I think the decoupling that you're talking about that's re really crucial is this, this conversation doesn't have a, uh, um, a sales pitch to it or a, an end product. It's just offering. It's offering and receiving. I mean, that's yes. the reciprocal nature of, yes, of, absolutely. The, of the relationship. And, and, and the challenge is, am I willing to be converted to? Right. Am I willing to be transformed by the relationship? Katie, you were going to offer something up. Yeah, I, I was just going to offer that um, my experience of when I would go to a poetry slam and do a poem about God in a, in a totally secular space, I experienced that as proclamation. And it was good news to other people when it was authentically rooted in my own spiritual journey when I used language that was not corny or canned or cliche, right? When the poem was beautiful and when it spoke truth, it was proclamation and people heard it as good news. And, and I think I'll just, I'll, I really appreciate what, what Jonathan said about also being converted, right? Like the more time that I spent with that poetry scene and with that poetry community, my, I learned what things were important to them, what struggles and issues people had had in their spiritual lives, and that in turn started to shape my poetry. Um, and so I never went to a poetry slam intending to invite people to my church, <laughs> right? That would have really, really been a faux pas. Um, I totally went with just the intention of, I want to share good news about God in this space. And that was quite attractive to many folks. And, and, and again, um, I would agree with that. I don't think that proclamation and sharing are pitted against each other. Um, when, when I, when I, when I sit down um, with somebody in the neighborhood and I ask the question, um, what kind of community do you dream of? Um, there's going to be times where I can proclaim the kingdom of God in that, right? Because I can say, this is the, what you're saying is actually the kind of community that Jesus modeled with his disciples um and 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 this is and this these are the truths that he spoke out against um you know when when he was you know chastising pharisees and scribes right so there's there's proclamation in there 
It, but it's the posture of the proclamation. What other stuff came up for, for people? What time's our break? How much time do we have? Um, if if uh, anyone else wants to get in a question or a comment, we've got we've got a couple of minutes, or we okay. can go ahead and um, take 15, 20 minute break. Yep. Any other, you know, kind of immediate responses or questions? Okay. Tony replied as well saying, for the novelty in Episcopal circles, I enjoy and prefer the dynamic term evangelization. Evangelization, nice. Cool. Jonathan, you got anything else for us or you want me to kind of wrap us up? Um, no, just again, just a, a reminder that um, we're, there's a PDF um, that we'll send out that's, that gives you a lot of detail and a lot of sample questions around this uh, relational meeting and what that looks like and what that means. Um, and it is connected to the evangelism initiatives um, work on the Episcopal Church website. So um, those links will, will go out to you as well. And yeah. that's why I didn't spend a lot of time explaining it. Fantastic. Um, so we're gonna take about a 20 minute break. Um, I know folks may wanna go get some coffee, take the bio break, maybe have some lunch. Um, can't remember quite to what time it is for you guys. If you eat an early lunch maybe. Um, and uh, so a lot of what Jonathan was saying are things that we'll send out, um, send out later, some more examples of questions that you could ask people um, like that. What are, you know, what are you most worried about or what are you most proud of in your neighborhood? I loved that one. Um, you could take this next 15 or 20 minutes of break and just like stick your head outside your house or wherever you are um, and notice somebody or something different. So just kind of know that as we come back together at a quarter till, um, I may throw that in the chat box. Like when you stuck your head out of your house during this break, uh, what did you notice or who did you notice that was a little different than, than you might have otherwise if you weren't paying this, this close relational attention? All right. Mallory, anything else we need to know before we, before we break? We're good. Oh, Mallory, if you're saying something, you're muted. Sorry, I'm having trouble unmuting myself. Computer <laughs> keeps disappearing while I'm trying to touch it. Okay. Um, uh, basically just probably that they are, are you wanting them to break completely away from the Zoom and come back into the Zoom? Or are you just thinking they can just turn their video and sound off and come back? Oh, on? let's just turn on video and sound. Right. Yeah. Go or ahead. if you want to just kind of hang out and chit chat, you're welcome right. to do if that. If you want to hang out and chit chat, um, you're more than welcome. But if you want to um, go take a break or something, you can turn your, your video um, and your sound off by using the little icons at the bottom of the screen there. And um, that's it. Great. We'll see you in about, now it's about 17 minutes. Okay, great. To invite uh, folks that maybe haven't done this, um, scroll, scroll up in your chat a little bit and, and Christy offered a, a wonderful um, vignette of, of this relational, um, attractive, you know, kind of community um, of bringing somebody to a church. Um, and they were not scared away from that person. And for Christy, that was a moment where saying, oh, that's, that's the kind of community that I wanna be a part mm -hmm. of. Um, it's exactly the kind of, kinds of things we're talking about. Um, we get to do that a lot as church planters, um, because again, we get to kind of start brand new, which is fun. Mm -hmm. um, but these are things, these are practices for, for every, every kind of community um, to think about and, and be about. I think one of the things I learned in planning a church 30 years ago was uh, don't be afraid to try plan B when plan A doesn't work. Uh, when something you do is 
is clearly not going anywhere, uh, do something else, uh, even if it's most uncomfortable. Uh, and pray a lot, just really pray a lot. I, uh, I was amazed at what it did for my prayer life. Yeah. And there was a lot of it was desperation. It was it was like, uh, you know, help, help. I like three weeks out from what was supposed to be our initial Sunday morning service, and maybe four weeks. Or, uh, I have no idea where I was going to get any music because I had no, and I had no program money. The diocese had purchased a piece of property and hired me and said, "Go out there and plant a church." And by the way. You have to you have to reach people who are not Episcopalians. You don't get to round up the Episcopalians in the area. You have to get other people. So, and then the next morning, this woman calls up who I'd known in college and says, "I think that I should come and play the piano for you for for the first year." <laughs> I, I wrote in the journal I was keeping. Talk about an answer to prayer. But uh, it was just, it was weird. We were starting out in a grade school, lunchroom and gymnasium, where we were for six years. And uh, it was, it was interesting. I learned, I was, I was an experienced priest, right? I had, had all kinds of different experience on a Native American reservation for eight and a half years, college chaplain for four years, uh, priest for a couple of small congregations and then I worked in the bishop's office as archdeacon for nine years. Mm -hmm. And I knew just enough about church planning to know I didn't know anything about church planning. So it was a huge learning experience. And the one thing they did give me was time. And they didn't set any benchmarks for what I had to do. Mm. Pretty freeing. So I love Katie Shedlock's face. <laughs> Can you call my bishop and explain that? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's the temptation. Of, and unfortunately, it causes churches then to do things that they shouldn't have done for their long term health. Oh. Build too soon, or uh, mm -hmm. I saw a couple of churches build too soon and then, and then pass out of existence. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Presbyterian church, and then one day I drove by it, and it was not a Presbyterian church. It was a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran church, because the plant had failed, and so I, I don't know. There's just we do we do the same we do the same kind of things in our established congregations too. Uh, yes. There's you know there's levels of like what um, a church should be, right? And um, and and a lot of us feel that that pressure. Um, so I think that's one way that we can all relate to each other. Well, next year at convention, we'll do like this seminar 2.0 and talk about those kind of themes. Pivoting, like you were saying, resorting to plan B, C, or D would be like another, another great theme that everyone can take something from and church plans have to do a lot. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm sure it's somewhere in the Bible that says, if you don't succeed, try, try again. Is that it? <laughs> it's got to be there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Great. We've got folks turning their videos back on. Um, and I've got that it's 1047, your time. Um, so let's, um, let's start another conversation. <clears throat> but a conversation that is uh, related. So just to remind you, I know we don't have, you know, a flip chart or anything up with our, the four themes that we're talking about, but um, Katie talked about this, uh, this theme of finding church outside of church. Jonathan um, just led us through a conversational on relational evangelism. Um, this piece is on um, participatory worship and then Arlen will close us out or finish us out um, with a piece on the gift of scrappiness. Um, and it's kind of interesting because um, I'm starting to see how all of these themes weave themselves together. And in fact, um, we talked a little about this comment that Tony Green uh, made earlier. It's a, actually a question that he threw in the chat box. Are proclamation and sharing at odds? 
Um, and it's funny because when I first read that question, Tony, um, I was thinking of it through the lens of this piece that I was about to lead. So the idea are proclamation as in preaching from a pulpit kind of proclamation and sharing the act of preaching at odds. And I know we were talking about something like totally different when you brought that up, but, um, but, it, but it, was an, it sort of stuck with me as, as this question, our, our, um, our proclamation and, and sharing of that proclamation at, at odds, or are they, something, are they something that all congregations should somehow share? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard this name, but I was talking to um, a friend of mine, a Zoom friend of mine, Bishop Mark Eddington. He is the Bishop of the Convocation of Episcopal Churches in Europe, which is like, that's an amazing job to have. He gets to live in Paris um, and it's just great. The context on the European continent, the religious context is pretty different, but it's one that, um, you know, I think Americans can look at and say, gosh, we might, we might be in this kind of cultural religious um, state within the next 10 or 15 years. So he's always fascinating to talk to. And Mark was making this observation that over the last 50 years, the Episcopal Church has seen all these changes, right? The, the ordination of, of women, um, the ordination and um, of, of, uh, of people who are gay, um, gay marriage, um, just massive change, right? But the most significant long lasting change um, that has happened. And he was actually a little critical of this. He said was the 1979 prayer books insistence that Eucharist is the principal Sunday service or ideally, right? The principal Sunday service for every worshiping community or every parish. And he said, this has just had um, these broad reaching consequences that we haven't quite wrapped our heads around. Um, one of the more negative consequences being um, the, what the consequence that, that the priest of a congregation in many contexts is now seen as the person who does everything, right? Um, I served, when I was first ordained, I served at a really small congregation, um, or at least for Alabama, it was small, like 35 people on a Sunday um, in the middle of nowhere. And this is a congregation that was used to never having a priest. So they were like just delighted that they had gotten a 25 year old, you know, graduate from seminary um, and that finally they were going to have a priest. Uh, but the difference, it was remarkable the difference in this congregation than in just about any other church in the Diocese of Alabama. Um, there was a Sunday when I had a stomach bug and I was like, there's just like no way. I'll never make it through the service. And my senior warden said, oh, that's fine. You just stay at home and I will preach. And I was just like shocked because I had been through like two years of homiletics class at VTS by this point. I'm like, how can you, how are you gonna preach, <laughs> right? And also delighted. Um, and I think that this is gonna feed in a little, um, that kind of story to what Arlen's gonna talk about the gift of scrappiness. But I think the reality is that at least in my diocese, but I suspect many other places throughout the Episcopal church, it is not the case um, that the senior or junior warden feels comfortable jumping up and saying, that's fine, you know, you go home and be sick, like I'll preach. Um, that's the gift of a congregation that's sort of still living pre-1979 um, and saying we take an active part in worship um, and it's not up to just the priest alone to do this proclamation, um, to, you know, um, administer, uh, you know, the, the sacraments and do all the pastoral care and make all the decisions, including, you know, the financial decisions down to the, like the landscaping, right? That's sort of this um, negative consequence. There've been some positive ones too, but a negative consequence of where, where we are now um, that, that Mark Eddington was sharing with me. Um, and, you know, for me, this goes back to this idea. We have a, a, a theological concept um, in Anglicanism and the Episcopal Church that how we pray shapes how we believe. 
So if we're used to seeing a priest up at the front um, of the room, leading us in the sacraments, leading us in the prayers, leading us in the sermon, um, then we begin to believe that it's only an ordained person or only our point leader who is able to do those things and has anything to contribute to, you know, what is um, God's message of good news to the world. That's kind of, a, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I think it, it is certainly true that, um, that we've sort of fallen into this rut of, of, um, of not actively inviting participation in the way that we can. Um, and yet at the same time, um, I think I've been a priest long enough, like almost, I guess, nine years now, that um, in the first, certainly in the first two years of my ministry, um, after graduating from seminary, I felt prepared to preach. Like, yay, Ruth Hannah Hook taught me how to preach. Um, I can do this. And then gradually, I think as I gained more experience with, uh, with people and with church and did a whole lot more praying, I sort of reached this point, especially when I started church planting. Frederick was just talking about how much praying you have to do when you're a church planter, that I started to come to this point of saying, I'm not sure I ever know what I'm talking about. And I'm surrounded by these people who are part of my church plant. Um, when I was first planting, uh, I had a number of social workers and therapists who were, were part of the community who knew so much more than I did um, about how to welcome people who were a little different, about how to welcome people who um, maybe weren't, you know, neurotypical, um, about how to uh, be present and show dignity to folks who are experiencing homelessness, um, et cetera, et cetera, who just knew more about those aspects of the good news than I did. Um, and all of that was kind of convalescing in this church plant where um, when you plant a church, you're starting out with like five people, right? Maybe that like quickly builds to 10, but it's a long time before you have enough people to quote, like preach to. Um, and so we found ourselves at the Abbey um, doing a lot more uh, conversational sermons and a lot less preaching. And it, it helped that um, the Abbey, my church plant here in Birmingham, started off um, not as a traditional church plant, you know, in a, in a school or in a traditional building, but as a coffee shop. And so we weren't even working with a furniture arrangement that lent itself to, um, to preaching. And so um, what sort of happened, um, I say it happened naturally, but it was actually very difficult at first as we began to create a culture of participatory um, worship but what we mean by participatory worship is often participatory preaching. So I think that I take that responsibility on maybe Christmas and Easter to deliver a, an actual homily, but almost the entire rest of the year, um, we preach to one another. I want to, um, I want to just show you a couple of pictures. Let's see if I can pull them up. Um, that show a little bit about what I mean. And then I, and then I really want to break, break off into some, um, into some smaller groups and have some conversation. So here are the practices. Practice sitting participatory worship. Um, one of those being that act of um, co-proclaiming um, the gospel of Jesus together um, as part of a conversation um, it invites people to uh, use their gifts to approach the gospel um, from their point of view as a social worker or sometimes um, as an artist, or we've had someone who even approached it as a lawyer, which was really interesting, um, and proclaim um, that work together. There's also um, some great ways other than preaching um, that our communities, uh, the Abbey included, although these pictures are actually from um, Jonathan and Katie's church creator's table of inviting um, people to uh, really um, share responsibility, right, for this good news and share responsibility um, for creating the liturgy together. Um, and actually, Katie, I was wondering if you'd explain, um, I know I didn't show you these pictures ahead of time, but I thought that they were really cool and I don't know if they're, they're related, um, but this idea of confession poems, um, 
in place of kind of the, the reading of confession? Would you say like a little bit more about what's going on here? Sure. So um, the confession poems was a practice that we had during Lent, uh, uh, two years ago and this, uh, this most recent Lent. Um, so in the tradition of the liturgy, right, often during Lent, the confession is moved to the, to the beginning of worship. Um, and we borrowed the idea of a confession poem out of the world of slam poetry, because poems in the slam word are very confessional um, in the sense that uh, someone is saying something that is deeply felt, deeply held, and that needs to, needs to come out, needs to be seen and heard. Um, by by the gathered community. Uh, so the prompt was like, confess, you know, something that's silly, something that you did when you were a kid, uh, something systemic, something that you've never said before, right? I think we had like 10 different, uh, different lines, so to speak, in the, uh, in the poem. And then each week at the beginning of the liturgy, uh, someone offered their confession poem. That was how we started our, our time of worship together. Um, and then as a community, we offered uh, the absolution uh, to that person. And it was really, um, it's something that has, I think, really resonated with folks because when we came, after we did that in year one for Lent, then when, as we were talking about what do we want to do for Lent, that was like the first thing was we loved those confession poems. Can we do those confession poems? Um, and actually, we're going to offer one as part of opening worship uh, today as well this afternoon. So you'll get to experience it. But yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And I love the idea, which I actually didn't know about offering a community absolution um, or co-offering that uh, to a person and so sharing um, the act of that kind of sacrament. Um, and then uh, a couple of other pictures. These are from um, the Abbey's uh, COVID era worship. So that's why it's, it's outside under a pavilion. Um, but we would do similar things um, even when we were indoors which is asking people from the congregation to bring a prayer station. Um, it worked really well during COVID because they were spread out. And so we could sort of naturally social distance. Um, the one on my left uh, is one of my favorites that someone brought. It says, um, who is someone you haven't been in touch with during quarantine or haven't been in touch with nearly enough during quarantine? Send them a text or an email right now and let them know that they are loved, right? So something that could be offered in a, in a sermon given by a priest as a challenge to a congregation, but it sort of changes the dynamic of that when people are asked to do it um, in the moment and as part, of their, as part of their liturgical experience. And then another that someone brought um, a few weeks ago was this wailing wall. I think they made it out of a tissue box. Um, <laughs> but uh, saying that the cracks in the Western wall are um, soaked in prayers um, and stuffed with prayers and, and offering you the chance not just to um, kind of name silently or loud those folks that you are praying for, but actually to write that down, put it in the box, and then whoever was in charge of the station um, took those prayers and, um, and burned them during their own prayer time later throughout the week. I think, I think sort of um, two things to think about. Um, I hope you kind of notice that um, the way I've introduced this idea of participatory worship um, isn't a, uh, hey, let me show you how cool Creator's Table is, or like how cool the Abbey is, that we're doing these innovative liturgical things, right? Um, I think there are churches that do some things that like look really good um, and look really cool in the moment. I think what these practices do rather than just, I mean, they're outside of the box, but they're more than outside of the box. They begin to form um, a community to really share uh, the act of liturgy, the act of worship, the act of right praying shapes believing. So the act of believing and then the act of going out um, and proclaiming the good news in the world, not having that rest on one person. Um, so, um, so they do that and then they shape a community um, that, that shares responsibility um, and commitment to one another. 
And so sort of the second piece of this that we, um, of this theme that we wanted to emphasize is that often these kind of participatory worship practices are things that don't work so well if you try them just once. Um, I mean, maybe it would be a great experience if you, if you did that texting thing or something once during a, during a sermon. Um, but it took, I was talking about how we, we host these conversational sermons at the Abbey. It probably took two or three years um, to really get those uh, to go in the kind of direction um, that they needed to go in order for them to actually be proclamations of good news, not just like moments to gripe um, or to talk about politics or to have Bible study, um, but to actually begin to direct people's attention towards saying, okay, you know, together as a community, what is the good news that we have to proclaim to this neighborhood? Um, and so in some ways, I want to put the word consistent um, on the title of this theme. This isn't just about participatory worship, although that's, that's good as well, but it's about the consistency um, of that participation in a way that it forms a community um, to share this responsibility for proclamation of the good news. I'm going to do uh, go into some breakout groups in just a minute, but um, just as I stop there for a second, are, are there any any comments or questions at this point? Great. Just um, go ahead and highlight um, that some folks have kind of named ways that they're doing that already in their congregations. So, so Kimmy at St. David's and Bishop Gretchen um, talked about a past experience of, of a priest um, and inviting, um, she grew up in a church where um, members were invited to share how they lived out their faith. Um, and then, and then Tony's talking a little bit about, um, reconciliation and, um, that being connected to baptismal covenant. There's a much more active, um, sense of, of what that, what that means. So, mm -hmm. and then, um, I talked about a liturgy guild, um, in connection also with what, Kimmy does, you know, so we have groups of people and it's not always the same people, but um, groups of people that will meet together prior to a new season and say, you know, here's how we want to kind of create more particip participatory worship together as a community. So mm -hmm. doing that work together. Yeah, and I like this uh, that Bishop Breberg is saying too, it's also about helping people understand that our worship also has within it participation already. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, that's right. one of the reasons why this is a theme that often comes up in church planting, where we're asked to sort of um, rediscover tradition that, that some of our um, established parishes have just sort of like gotten and um, take, for, take for granted and, and help rediscover and reproclaim that, um, what we're already doing. Good. So I want to uh, see if we can break out. Um, into those rooms. Mallory, it can be the same, the same groups or different groups. It doesn't really matter for about, um, oh, we'll do like seven or eight minutes. And um, there's sort of, there's two questions. And I, I want to invite lay leaders and clergy to, to think about these, so sort of think about them from your, from your own perspective. Um, the first is, is there an aspect of worship um, no, I'm sorry. The first is, do you have a story of a time when you felt actively engaged in worship, where you really felt invited to participate or like you were living into that participation? Do you have a story about that? And then the second is, is there an aspect of worship you wish you were invited to respond to in the moment? And I will start typing those in the chat. Oh, perfect. Jonathan's got this. So do you have a didn't story quite get the a, second one. Perfect. Um, so do you have a story of a time when you felt actively engaged in worship? And then is there an act of worship you wish you were invited to respond to in the moment? Be part of a congregation. Do you have a priest where you frequently disagree with stuff they're saying in the sermon and you wish you could participate? And as we get those breakout rooms together, I will tell you, um, participatory preaching 
has been made that much more interesting by uh, Zoom worship and the chat box. People feel real invited to outright disagree with each other uh, when there's a chat box going on. Great, looks like we've come back. And just to close us out for this piece, there were some um, things that were said in my breakout room, at least, that I kind of want to make a note about and put in that chat box for later for you all to see. Um, so I invite you to pull out the chat um, and just record some of those thoughts, um, ideas, and maybe even little snippets of stories um, so that we will uh, have them to share with one another. Um, and to refer back to. Good. And um, in our roundup email where we throw out some of these resources for you, one of my challenges um, is going to be that in your parish, keep these two questions close at, close at hand. What are those moments um, in your identity and your practice as a, 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 a worshiping Christian, a person who worships with a, with a congregation? Um, where you felt really um, active and participatory in worship? And what are some of those places where you would like to experience more participation? And what might be some small experiments um, that your congregation could take on um, just to try this out in a, in a deeper way or in a new way? So keep all that going in the chat box uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Arlen. So we have, um, we've been praying a prayer together as a diocese and maybe some of you are familiar with it and it, it's a prayer written by Christy Phillips who's on this call. And we have been invited to pray it as a diocese by our Bishop because we're actively looking for um, those places in our diocese that may need new churches. And the, the prayer begins, gracious and loving God, you call us to plant uh, tables in the wilderness, to set tables in the wilderness. And in that Anglican and Episcopal tradition, where we are often praying the things that we believe and also where our deepest prayers hold a space of vision for us of what we want, whether it is those morning prayer collects or the evening prayer collects in which we are asking for things. We are also picturing a future. And the future pictured in that prayer is a future that has drawn me since I first heard about church planting when I was about 15 or 16 years old. This image of a new table um, and a table where some of my friends um, could find a seat, friends who didn't see themselves seated around the tables in which we were already gathered, um, a new table that was warm and welcoming and a place where people belonged. And that vision of church planting completely captured my imagination um, beginning in high school and led me to, um, to prepare for pastoral ministry and then to give myself to training for church planting. But then when I actually started doing church planting, the thing that became immediately evident to me is that the work of church planting is actually the work of setting up chairs. Um, setting up chairs in elementary school uh, cafeterias and YMCA gymnasiums and um, doing the actual day in and day out work of physically creating those signs and spaces where community can happen. A few years ago, um, when I was involved in the most recent church plant that I was involved in, I was in seminary and in Austin, Texas, working with um, an unusual priest in the Episcopal Church because he has spent his entire ministry so far church planting. 
his first call out of seminary was to start a new church in Virginia. And this was in a previous model of church planting, at least mostly a previous model in our own tradition in which there was a brand new suburb growing up. This was the birth of the suburbs. And so a bishop identified that there were hundreds of people moving into this brand new suburb in Virginia and it needed a new Episcopal church. And here was this bright and dynamic Episcopal priest and they thought he'd be perfect. So he started this church and on the first Sunday, there were 350 Episcopalians there, which is a story I'm guessing not a lot of us hear very often, especially on the West Coast. And maybe it uh, intersects with what Jonathan was describing earlier as an attractional model of church planting. But he led this congregation for many, many years. Um, they built a new building, they started an elementary school. They grew to be one of the largest parishes in their diocese in Virginia. And then he got to a point where he felt like he was ready for his next call. And the Diocese of Texas welcomed him. And um, he was called to start a new church in Austin, Texas, in the Hill Country. And I was a part of that congregation and they were meeting in an elementary school cafeteria and the folks who were part of the congregation were mostly a few dozen folks from area Episcopal churches who had decided to join this new church and be part of trying to make something new or create something new um, in this area. And because they were coming from these varied experiences, they after you know a year and a half or so in the elementary school cafeteria were longing to have a space of their own were longing for an organ were longing for those parts of what had been their experience in more established episcopal churches um, that connected them with their sense of the sacred and their sense of what community should look like. And yet here we were on Sunday mornings, backing a trailer up to the elementary school cafeteria, unloading sound equipment, setting up um, cafeteria tables and turning them into pews and seats. And I was talking with this church planter about the community's longing for something more like what they had experienced in the past. And he said to me, you know what's going to happen as soon as we move into our own building is everyone's going to be talking about that time, that sweet time when we used to be together in the cafeteria, setting up the chairs and setting up the speakers. And I really resonate with that. And I resonated uh, with it both as um, a person who has been church planting and been so frustrated with what is often the inherent scrappiness of church planting so frustrated myself with what feels like limited resources or limited time, or we don't have enough people involved. And I'm guessing that regardless of what your congregational setting is, that there are moments when you resonate with that. And I think that, especially right now with COVID, we all resonate with, um, with scrappy church. Um, we, we are all doing scrappy church right now. And what I'd like to suggest is that there are deep gifts in um, scrappiness and that 
the way of scrappiness has deep connection to the gospel. Of course, that very, very familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the large crowds is a story about scrappiness. It's a story about loaves and fishes that become food for a community. And that is a story that we often tell in stewardship season when we're asking each other to really give, um, to really um, show up with your loaves and fishes. Um, but I think there's so much more to it than just money. And I think that the appreciation of scrappiness um, is maybe in my experience, one of the key things that keep people who are doing ministry of all kinds, whether thrift planting or not, from burning out, um, from getting frustrated. When we were in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, when my wife and I were in Chattanooga, we were learning how to do church planting from um, a church planter. And we were meeting in a YMCA gymnasium. Now this is think rock bands in the YMCA gymnasium. This is not like maybe your usual Episcopal church where you, you know, where you worship. And so our problem was the sound that we're trying to make with this rock band is bouncing off the gymnasium walls. So we, it's just noise. And maybe that's how you fear, you know, maybe that's how you feel about rock music in church anyway. But um, for us, this is a big problem. So our solution was that we found this sound, uh, uh, I guess, holding fabric material online. So every Sunday before we set up the church, we would hang wire all around the gymnasium and hang these huge pieces of burlap so that it would catch the sound um, and it wouldn't bounce off the walls. And the burlap smelled horrible. It smelled like we were all dying of chemical poisoning. And it was just a, uh, really, really terrible experience. And we identified, we got to get out of this space. So we went looking for a new space for this young congregation. And we found this beautiful old sanctuary in a United Methodist church in downtown Tattanooga. And we were able to use it on Sunday nights. And um, we were able to put candles in the windowsills. And it was simultaneously an experience of scrappiness and an experience of settledness for our community. And we were there maybe for uh, two years. We had a couple of very, very sweet years in that space. And I think what happened is I think that some of the folks in leadership in that church we're happy with what the church community was, but at the same time, disappointed that the church community hadn't grown into something bigger, into something sexier. This is Chattanooga, Tennessee, so it's the Bible Belt, and there are lots of folks doing church ministry and church planting. And there were lots of churches around us that were growing by leaps and bounds in the hundreds where we were growing in the tens. And I think for this particular church planter, he had a feeling of pressure that we needed to be more than what we were. And so he decided that he would make a huge budgetary leap and rent um, an amphitheater downtown um, that was going to cost us about three times the amount of money we were spending on a weekend. And unfortunately, the finances of that, the pressure of that um, created a sense of not enough in the community and eventually led uh, to the closing of that church plant. And it's very common for church plants to close 
I, I think that something like maybe some of you folks who, uh, who know more about it than me in the current literature can say that I think something like 80% of new church plants close. It is hard work to do church planting and there is a, a high rate of, um, of closure similar to new businesses. And I think that one of the gifts of church planting in that respect is that church planting can give us maybe uh, the gift of being aware that everything has a finite life. Even churches um, have finite lives. And maybe that's a different way of thinking about scrappiness. But this church eventually closed, and I think it closed because it, it wasn't happy with the inherent scrappy situation that it was in. A third story of scrappiness, um, our family moved to San Francisco in 2008 to help to plant a church called Eucharist. And we had no money. We had $500. Um, we were working full time. We lived in a neighborhood together and we knew two people in the city besides people in our family. And so we were in this inherent space of scrappiness, of not having much to work with, but having to discover in ourselves with a new community that was growing what the gifts were in our place. So we were never in a space where it was our community offering something to a larger community. It was always us discovering life in the midst of a community with other people, always needing to appreciate the gifts that were showing up at our doorstep. So just as an example of this, um, after we were at um, a number of around 50 folks gathered, we made a decision to renovate um, a space in downtown San Francisco. And it had been for a long time a former bank. And so it had a huge 2,000 pound bank vault door in the back of the space, concrete walls um, that were just an absolute mess. But we thought, wow, we could, we could see this being not just a church in this area, but a third space in the area. What if we envision this space as not just ours, but we envision this as a community space? So along those lines, we invited some nonprofits that were just getting started to use our space for board meetings. We got to know some folks who were trying to do um, some work in uh, real estate development and neighborhood organization to use the space and consider it theirs. We hosted um, in the space um, mixers for people who were trying to build businesses. And when we were finally ready to open the space to the public, we threw a huge party and we invited everyone who had a connection to our community, who had a connection to the space. It wasn't a worship gathering, it was a party. And we had somebody in our midst who was an artist. They had this brilliant idea, since we didn't have very much money to decorate the space, of at the party, setting out these long boards and on these long boards, he had drawn by hand um, triangles and shapes and then put numbers in each of the triangles and shapes so that it became a community art project in which everyone at the party was invited to help paint these 
enormous tall stained glass windows that would become the primary focal point and decoration for our worship. And I'll share as one slide with you now, I'll share what those finally look like when we were done with the project. Let's see. So you can see what those look like at the front of the space. This is an idea that I never would have had myself. I'm not that creative. Nobody else on our team would have had an idea like this, but I think it's a really cool take on what is a very common thing in worship spaces, which are stained glass windows. And it was painted in a paint by number way at an opening party by lots and lots of people who were connected to our church community, but who did not join us for worship, who were not a part of um, our Bible studies or um, our, you know, explicitly Christian gatherings. So, three stories of scrappiness. One story about scrappiness in an Episcopal church context, church plant. One story about trying to live with scrappiness in the tension of the good and the overextension. And another story about scrappiness as a way of finding shared gifts. I think those stories go a long way towards offering a perspective on scrappiness that all of us can relate to. The gifts of scrappiness, I think, are that one, scrappiness gives us permission to appreciate in our midst what we already have. And I hear that theme throughout everything that the other uh, presenters have said in our conversations so far about what are you, what's going on in your congregation. I think scrappiness also lets us know each other more authentically, um, including letting us know ourselves more authentically. Um, when we're scrappy, we really need each other and we have to do work together that is maybe out of our comfort zone. When we were renovating this space in downtown San Francisco, we had a lot of young people in their 20s and 30s who had never used a hammer before. These are city people. <laughs> um, and they were using a hammer for the first time, or they were painting for the first time. Um, and that kind of vulnerability is another way of naming it, um, that it has been named in this presentation. It, it has a way of creating a space where we have to meet each other and appreciate each other and what we have to offer. Scrappiness also knows that it needs gifts from outside of the community. I also think that scrappiness keeps us closer to the ground and aware of our own limits. As I mentioned with the story of the Chattanooga church plant, um, I think we're tempted in church life sometimes to overestimate um, maybe our ego gets involved or our fears get involved and we want something bigger and better than what we already have um, but the reality is that for community health for our own individual health we need to stay close to the ground and aware of our limits and finally i think that scrappiness reminds us that we're not finally in control and like I mentioned with the frequent death rate of church planters, um, church plants rather, not church planters, I think that scrappiness reminds us that we're not in control finally of this life. We're not in control finally of the life of the church. And when we practice with that, um, we can learn a way of relating to our faith and a way of relating to our community that is 
less controlling. Um, so um, I see that the chat has been super active uh, throughout this session. And I wonder, I'm trying to remember, Katie Shedlock, are you watching the chat right yeah, now? Yeah, there were, there were two questions that, um, that uh, I, I wondered if you wanted to respond to. One was um, from Bishop Gretchen, if you have like a list of essential principles of scrappiness, I think some of the ways that you just outlined it might, um, might answer that in some way, but if you had other like es essential principles of scrappiness, um, and then the other question uh, is around scrappiness and messiness, how those things are interrelated and overlapping or, or different. I'd like to take the second question first. Um, I think of messiness sometimes about relationship, and I think that that is it's characteristic of churches and communities of all kinds to be messy. We even saw that with the uh, um, poetry slam. Um, I, you could see a lot of mess um, in those communities. I think I mean something different by scrappiness. I think I mean something about um, the resources of a community. And I think our long time uh, sort of cultural history as Episcopalians is, and maybe it's not so much true in the West, but um, it's that we have resources. We have money, we have talent, we have education, and um, sometimes those very aspects of our culture and our heritage can make our expectations so high that we miss the, um, the community that can happen in our midst um, that can be created by a lack of resources. Um, so that's maybe one way I would uh, differentiate messiness from scrappiness. I'm not sure I have much to say about principles of scrappiness um, beyond what I, I said in terms of the list at the end. Maybe Bishop Gretchen, maybe you have something to say about principles of scrappiness. Oh, and I think you got to what I was, um, you know, as I, I wrote that question long before you got to your list, but I think sometimes people assume small equals scrappy and we've always seen that small can also equal stuck. Right, it's, it's, there's, there's, so part of it was thinking about, you know, and you just said resource, if you have resources, we don't necessarily think about, we can fall away from being scrappy. Are there things that we can think about where you can be an established, wealthy, highly resourced congregation and be scrappy, right? Are there, so some, some of that is mentality, right? And so thinking about in terms of how do we apply scrappiness regardless of, size of resource um, abundance of, of people or wealth how can you have the that flexibility like um, I mean Mal Mallory just put in there which is great the flexibility of a group the ability to organize and utilize you know so and I think that's part of what I'm getting at is it um, or we're wondering if you were getting at so because I think sometimes people if you're poor you're scrappy well not necessarily if you're small you're scrappy not necessarily but maybe you have the greater potential to not be stuck because you have to do something different. So. I love that. I think about it all the time because now I'm, I'm working at St. John's Cathedral and it's not a scrappy church um, in, in the sense of um, scrappy churches uh, or scrappy church plants that I've been a part of in the past. And what I noticed though, is that in the committees that I'm a part of, which sometimes can be very, very formal, um, there's incredible creativity present. Um, there's incredible openness, um, incredible flexibility. And sometimes um, there are also big blocks of imagination. Um, um, 
that keep us from seeing what's already present in the room or what's already present around us as gifts. Um, and I think that maybe is one of the ways in which um, my experience with less resources um, helps me see sometimes some things that are present um, that some people don't see. Um, what I'd like to do, are there any other questions or reflections right now? Just what a I like to Hamilton quote in the chat from Bishop Gretchen, thinking mm. about uh, being scrappy and being hungry, uh, the desire to just get it done without focusing on why we can't or why we shouldn't or what's in our way. Yeah. That's really good. I've not seen Hamilton or heard Hamilton, which is probably shocking, but um, it sounds Marlon, like I will bring you the yeah. tape. I'll bring you the CD. Oh, good. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like hungry <laughs> is not necessarily a good thing. Um, it's not. No, about no, it's the... fine. It's a good thing. Okay. It's, it's want. It's wanting. It's. It's. I, I hear this in hungry as I'm really wanting something, and I sometimes think in our churches we can get complacent and want, but not be hungry enough to go get it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I. Th I think that's really right. Um, um, what I'd love to do now is uh, send us into some breakout groups and talk about um, two questions. One is, um, what are the gifts that you've received in a scrappy moment of ministry? And um, where can you use some scrappiness in ministry right now? So what are the gifts that you've received in a scrappy moment of ministry? And where can you use some scrappiness right now in, uh, in your church ministry? Great. So thinking about six minutes, six, seven minutes. Perfect. And then we'll come back and just wrap up. All right. And I think we're back. Arlen, do you need this last minute for anything or you want me to close this out? No, close this out. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Well, Rangers, we do want to say thank you to you for being here and being present with us. This was a, this was great. And since I'm on this, I'm going to take the advantage of, of jumping in and saying thank you so much for, for being part of our diocesan convention. So oh, thank you, Bishop. I appreciate that a lot. And thanks, uh, thanks, Arlen and Katie and Jonathan. This was awesome. Um, as you can all probably uh, tell, or at least hopefully tell, um, the Episcopal Church has been in a big push in the last uh, six or seven years to do more church planting work and more missional work. Um, and so we continually discover more about what those practices are by uh, being invited to do workshops like this um, and doing the brainstorming that it took to do this kind of preparation. Um, some of these practices are continuously being revealed. So as you uh, take it forward, uh, please be in touch with, um, certainly with Katie, Jonathan and Arlen because they're in your diocese, but also uh, with me and I'll make sure that my email address and all that gets um, sent out to you so that if you have any, if you have any epiphanies um, about doing this work, you can share them with us. Great. And I was kind of, I was kind of wondering, maybe this is presumptuous, it's, uh, blah, 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 blah. who was it that has done church planting before? Is he still on? Fred. Well, David's still on. Fred. Fred Somebody is our can... elder, elder church planter. Yeah. Is he still on here? Not sure. Well, David Gordner has yes. been involved. So yeah. could we ask, uh, David, would you like bless us? Because we presenters need some blessing too. Oh gosh. Okay. Sure. Be delighted. Okay. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> also with you. God, we give you thanks for the gift of life and the opportunity for ministry, the invitation you've given us to go out and to reach out 
and to bring people together, to draw people together. And um, that is a charge for each one of us. And we give you thanks for those who are directly involved in church planting, um, living that out every day. And uh, we pray that you will help us step into their shoes and their um, gifts and learn their gifts uh, for our own spaces and that we can all be supportive of one another throughout this time. We pray for them and for their strength and um, um, fill them with your strength and uh, grace and peace and sense of your presence as they continue their work. Uh, and please fill us with a sense of that same passion. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Great. Go forth, plant some new seeds. Have a great convention. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Peace.